Colorado River is one of the hardest working rivers in the world. It supplies a population of approximately 40 million people. We're facing a number of challenges on the Colorado River now related to shortages. We're in the 22nd year of a drought. On top of that, we've got climate change. And then we're also seeing increases in demand. The Colorado River has pretty much always been overallocated. We assumed there was far more water in the river than there was. We're now past that point. We're in this point of we're seeing a rapid and consistent decline. That has clearly galvanized attention. The communities across the basin are coming together to find solutions. Agriculture is always a major part of any conversation of land and water issues in the West. Colorado Basin Agriculture produces 15% of the national produce. It occupies 4 million acres of land and it uses 70, 75% of the water. The future of agriculture in the West is intimately linked to the future of the whole basin, our sustainability, and our ability to live within the water resources that we have. The Babbitt Center, we recognize that. And for us, it's a question of how can we help the agricultural communities find a long-term sustainable future. As we've started looking around for creative solutions, one that's come to our attention is the Pueblo, Colorado, Bessemer Ditch area. We're particularly fascinated by how we can make land markets work to preserve the most prime lands. When people think of Pueblo, they think of entering the southwestern United States. East of the city of Pueblo, we have three historic farm communities, St. Charles Mesa, Vineland, and then we have Avondale. These communities are served by an irrigation ditch, the Bessemer Ditch, which comes off the Arkansas River. The land that is irrigated by the Bessemer Ditch is about 15,000 acres, and that's about 2% of the total agricultural land in Pueblo County. And so it's a small percentage, but it actually contributes close to 40% of the agricultural economy. It's a great value to have agriculture right in your back door. Obviously, the most popular crop grown in the Pueblo area is the Pueblo chili, and that's an amazing crop because it has a lot of cultural significance for many, many people. The water in the Bessemer Ditch is some of the more senior water in the Arkansas River Basin. Pueblo water has a number of junior Colorado River water rights in their portfolio, but with climate change and with drought, those water rights are not as reliable as people once thought they were. They went out to farmers along the Bessemer Ditch and they purchased water rights. They have secured the water future of Pueblo. Pueblo water purchased 5,540 shares. So that's gonna dry up a little over 5,000 acres, a little bit more than one third of the land on the Bessemer Ditch. There is nothing strategic about the way this sale has happened. It's willing buyers, it's willing sellers, it's resulting in a fragmented landscape. When buy and dry happens, the farmers that remain are the ones that suffer. And there are these ripple effects that go out to all the businesses that go to support agriculture, tractor dealer, food processor, they're all gonna suffer. Downstream, all along the Arkansas Valley, we've had buy and dry activity what you see in adjacent counties like Crowley County is just this massive swath of just weed infested, abandoned land. I mean, it's really an economic and environmental wasteland. Dry up is gonna happen. The goal would be to dry up more strategically. We analyzed what we call critical production areas. They're designated as prime farmland. They are larger units surrounded by other contiguous clusters Normally, Pueblo water would have to dry up the farms it purchased water from. When we talked with farmers, they made it clear that most of the land that's poised to be dried up are the most productive lands, and those are the lands that we need to save. There is a specific provision in Pueblo water's decree that farmers, conservation groups, and Pueblo water worked on together, and it's called a substitution of dry up provision. It's to give remaining farmers the opportunity to acquire really good farmlands that will otherwise be dried and bring water to those lands from areas where we don't have as great of an impact on production. We worked with the Freshwater Trust to develop a dynamic tool that essentially enables decision makers to see what dry up scenarios can we implement to maintain total agricultural economic outputs at the same level on 10,000 acres that we have right now with 15. Palmer Land Conservancy is working with the first farmer 
doing a substitution project. We work with the local farmers to set up this framework. Once the concept is proven, then it will be a market-based voluntary system. When you move water onto a more productive farm, the real estate value is gonna go up. The crop yield is gonna go up. That's kind of the ultimate value proposition. Not only are we doing the right thing for the local community, there's water quality improvements, soil improvements, and there's wildlife habitat improvements. We have the county that's advocating for the preservation of ag. The city of Pueblo is willing to do something a little different. And we have farmers and conservation groups that are interested. So we think right here, right now, this is the best opportunity we have to show how to do this a little differently. There are lessons learned here in Pueblo that can be applied in other water-starved regions of the West. I think it would be the greatest tragedy if our future generations looked back and said, you know, you had this Garden of Eden and you let it go. Agriculture throughout this basin looks very different in very different places. So by contrast to Bessemer, where we have small-scale agriculture, then we have places like Western Arizona, where we have large-scale industrial agriculture. Very different issues, very different solutions. The Yuma is known as the world's winter salad bowl. Close to 90% of all the leafy greens for all of North America are grown here between Thanksgiving and Easter. There's so much comes together here between the water from the Colorado River, the weather that allows year-round farming, that great soil, researchers, producers, technology, the labor pool. If you were gonna choose anywhere to produce a national food supply, this would be the place. Yuma actually has among the oldest water rights on the river, other than the tribal nations, but we're also at the very tail end of the river, right? So, I mean, the water's gotta get here or we can't use it. Going forward, what it's gonna to take to continue to do that is really the progressive growers and their willingness to do things different. Researchers and others who come up with new technologies, new ways to do things. What are the efficiencies? What are the productivities? What are the improvements that are being done? And you can leave that amount of water back in Lake Mead to help alleviate shortages. Over the last 30 to 40 years, we're producing about 30% more crop uh, with about 30% less water. Some of the best ways that we have become more efficient with water is through the use of technology. Every field is dead level. So they go in every year with GPS or laser equipment. So there's no runoff. So water's put on and then it just soaks into the ground. I think you'll see more use of drip and sprinkler irrigation. You'll see continued improvement and updating of lining of canals with concrete to save from seepage. And then I think you'll see some very cool genetic technology in the crops that we grow going forward. Yuma County is made up of different valleys that have different microclimates. And the seed, believe it or not, is specially produced for a certain time of year and certain location here in the county. We need to create those pathways, we need to fund research, and we need to grow our STEM education so that folks grow up to be the scientists developing products and the tools that we will definitely need in the future. Agriculture is changing so much with technology all the remote sensing and drones, that's the future of agriculture and the way to be more efficient and more productive. And that appeals to a much broader workforce that can deal with big data analytics and how do you get it back as decision tools for farmers to do something different. One of the issues we have is we're at the bottom end of the Colorado River. It's very salty when it gets down here. You can't grow these tender crops if the soil is salty. We are scientifically measuring what does the crop need and also what are the impacts to the soil salinity. We're taking all that database that we built up and creating an app, and it makes recommendation to the farmer of when they should water, how much they should water, and it's real time. More and more of the world with climate change is becoming an arid environment. Lessons learned here, technologies developed here, can be applied around the world, and I think that's an important aspect of what's being done here. I always tell people we're standing on the shoulders of giants because of what they did in the early 1900s. Since we know the river's over-allocated, we need to think big. What are we doing to provide for the next three, four, five generations down the line? We need to be working on that today. Now really is a critical time for us to be looking at our agricultural futures, for helping communities determine what that future is that they want. It has a lot to do with capacity building. We don't have the answers, but we want to work with communities to help them find the future they want and how to get there. Our goal here is to be a catalyst. 
it's going to require both cooperation and collaboration to identify those futures. Because it's only those solutions that we find collectively that will endure.